Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, February 27, 2014, and this is a week in charts. I know I say this every week, and believe it or not, once again, we've got a lot to cover. So I'm going to go get a little jacked up on some Mountain Dew. Makers of Mountain Dew do not compensate me for this endorsement. Hey, PepsiCo, you out there? Let me know. Red Bull sells too fat. Maybe we should go off the monster. Had a little road trip last Friday. We had a few monsters. Kept me up in the drive. All oh, good stuff. All right. Enough of that nonsense. There's a disclaimer screen. If you've been trading for more than a day, you probably know you can lose money trading. Or as I like to say, all predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Hey, do me a favor. Throw me a bone. Uh, the saga continues on um, on Amazon. Somebody threw me a stinker review saying it works, and I think that's the way to trade. But I'm going to give him a bad review. It's like it was very confusing for me. So if you don't mind, just to help balance things out, if you like the book, you can say you liked it. Um, and we got another one. I think I got one just yesterday. So I want to thank you for that. Uh, I think um, it might have been Win. I'll put that in there. Who occasionally is um, in these shows? When you're out there, thank you very much. I think it was when. I may be wrong. All right, what do we talk about? I want to talk a little bit more about overbought, oversold. And I woke up this morning, kind of thinking from a common sense standpoint on that. And then there's so much in trading that is just common sense, and that we tend to make it more and more complicated. And as humans, I suppose, and I think we. We put a little bit too much emotions into it. We try to quantify too much. And there's a plethora of things that we do that are just, um, oh, not right. And I'm going to flesh all that out in just one second. Uh, I want to talk a little bit. Uh, we, last week we talked about smoke them if you got them, which turned into a better than poke in the eye trade. And it's actually coming back today. It might actually work as a new setup. But we're going to talk about that in just one minute and the importance of that. Um, market pruning, I'm not going to talk too much about that. That's left in, over from uh, last time. But I, I'm going to show the portfolio, and I do want to talk a, a little bit about that. I also want to talk uh, mostly, I guess, or, or quite a bit about, uh, again, the ongoing thing we talk about, the pressure's off with predicting the market direction. But I also want to talk about how the pressure can be off if you are – planning your trade and then trading your plan and that's going to make a lot more sense in just a few minutes uh, user requests uh, on the slides if you don't mind just ask questions about what's on the slides when we get to the charts start asking about stocks uh, if you don't mind one stock at a time so if you want to know about three stocks type it XYZ hit carriage return they still call it carriage return hit ABC hit carriage return etc uh, I, you could ask about 100 stocks. I don't care, but if, if you put them all in a row, I'm going to pick one out the list and delete the question and go on to the next one because it's too hard for me to keep up with which ones I covered, which ones I did. So hopefully that makes some sense. Let's talk a little bit more about overbought and oversold. And keep in mind these are relative levels, but when the market gets runs up quickly, it becomes overbought meaning that it seems a little pricey. And if it drops quickly, it seems a little oversold, meaning that it's sold out. And who's left to buy, who's left to sell in overbought and oversold conditions, respectively. Now, don't overthink overbought, oversold. Just eyeball the charts. It's OK to look at things on a net, net, basis beating like where was the market a week ago and where is it now and if percentage wise based on the volatility of the instrument it's a pretty big move then it's probably overbought or conversely on the downside oversold well the next question is how much percent given the volatility well it all depends on the market the S&Ps have a fairly low HV, I think about 13 last time I looked, maybe even lower. We can look at it in just one second, historical volatility rating uh, or ranking, how you want to look at it. 
I guess rating is the right way of saying it. So a 6% drop like we saw recently, we're going to talk about just one second, over a few weeks' time is pretty big. And conversely, a 6% rally over a short period of time is a pretty decent rally. So that becomes overbought and over. So, but again, don't think about it too much. Just eyeball your charts. Um, I wouldn't try to quantify it, okay? or qualify it and also as I think I warned last week be careful with the bound bound I guess that's how you say that I've tried to, he tried to say oscillator if you have an oscillator that goes from from 0 to 100 well guess what it's gonna peak out at you guessed it 100 okay that doesn't mean anything because that market could just become even more overbought but when you look at this beautiful little oscillator it's like oh look I just saw what it comes right here okay I don't know why I'm speaking like a fancy lad but and I just buy when it comes down here um, no it's not gonna work okay because overbought can always become much more overbought and oversold can always become much more oversold in fact as I've been saying it's a good way to end up living in a cardboard box or a van down by the river trying to sell overbought and buy oversold. Many of fortunes have been lost doing just that. And this is especially true if you're looking at some sort of index that has bounds, meaning that it gets to one side and it automatically has to stop. The only place it could go is down from there, okay? Now, granted, you might have a little oscillator that shows you when the market is overbought, and that's fine, but just realize just because it's overbought doesn't mean it can't go higher. Now, what good is overbought? Well, overbought tells you that it's dangerous to buy into the environment at that level. So that's about all it's good for, okay? <laughs> and the other thing, no, it's actually good for a lot more things too, okay? You don't want to necessarily jump into new positions when a market is overbought, new positions on the long side, unless you really, really like the setup. Then, by all means, take it. That above and beyond everything is your litmus test, how much you like a setup on whether or not you're going to take it. Ideally, you want the market to be trending in the same direction, the sector to be trending in the same direction, et cetera, and you don't want the market to be overbought. Ideally, the market should be set up, maybe pull back. looks like it's turning back in the direction of the trend. In other words, turn it back up, set up like a pullback itself. Uh, in an ideal world, all these pieces of the puzzle fit. Maybe once a year you'll see me write a column and I will show you where the market is set up as a pullback, the sector is set up as a pullback, and the stock is set up as a pullback. And then I'll follow through, and not all the time because there's no givens in this business, but in every instance I can remember, when everything is just set up perfectly, it usually works, okay? But you can't always get that. So if you have a mediocre setup and you can't decide whether to go long or not and the market is overbought, then don't buy the stock. Okay, So that's where it can be somewhat useful. But one thing I want to talk about is opposed to, as opposed to, this is what I woke up thinking about it this morning, as opposed to quantifying it or qualifying it, especially using an oscillator, just kind of get your head wrapped around what it is. And I guess the best way of looking at it is when you have a price jump, it creates a disequilibrium. And by the same token, a price drop creates a disequilibrium. So let's say you're used to a stock or coffee or pig bellies, pork bellies, I should say, be at a certain price and all of a sudden they make a big jump over a short period of time to a new level, okay? Well, this new level seems expensive, okay, for lack of a better word, or no, let's, let's, that's the best word to use, expensive. It's also another word synonymous with expensive would be overbought. It just seems like it's, it's too high. But as I've said quite a bit, if it stays high for a while, then it doesn't seem so overbought or doesn't seem expensive. You get used to it. So what's high and what's low becomes relevant. And as I've said recently, 
Sometimes a market could walk off an overbought condition by going sideways. So the market has time to digest those gains, so to speak. People get used to that disequilibrium. It becomes an equilibrium in price. Now, what's high or low is relative. Okay, I had some friends of mine on Facebook uh, not too long ago take some snapshots of their gas pump, and it had 299 on it, and that was a big deal. And so $3 gas, or just below $3 gas, is actually cheap. And that's crazy, huh? $3 for a gallon of gas, and that's cheap? Well, that's because everyone has become accustomed to that price, okay? Now, let's say gas... I don't know where it is now. I don't pay much attention when I fill up, and I don't get out much. <laughs> I think it's like 3.30 something or whatever. I, you know, I should, but I don't. Uh, but anyway, let's say gas jumps from $3 to $4. Well, then maybe people are thinking, $4, that's too high. I'm not going to buy any gas, okay, any more gas, or I'm going I'm to stop going anywhere. I'm not going to leave the house. That's too expensive, okay? So... That becomes an overbought level, but the longer it stays at $4, that becomes the norm. The same goes for coffee, stocks, or any other commodity or anything out there, okay? So it becomes a bit of a relative type of deal. Now, as I said a minute ago, sometimes the market could walk off an overbought condition. So last week we talked about this. We had the 6% drop in here. This market is pretty oversold at 6%. And it also looks like, hey, well, let's just buy it. Well, settle down, Beavis. It was pretty oversold here, I guess, around 4%. Then it kept on dropping. Yes, sooner or later, the market will reverse. And the people who will sell you on an overbought, oversold system are saying, hey, just jump in, just jump in, because it's going to reverse. Well, the problem is sometimes... It don't. So buying over sold and shorting over bought will work until it don't. Now this is a chart from last week. We get all the way back up here. We're a little overbought. Now what happened last week? Well, in last week's show we were having this outside day down form, if memory serves. And I'm pretty sure we were talking about the baby with a poopy diaper pattern and how it was the end of the world. Okay, that's a candle pattern, in case you're wondering what it is. I don't use candles, but that's a candle pattern, um, as far as you know. But then look what the market did. It just sort of, pretty much, for the most part, went sideways. It might have drifted up a little bit, but for the most part, it went mostly sideways. So the market begins to adjust to these prices. The longer it goes sideways, the more that's going to be perceived as the new price, okay, that this equilibrium becomes equilibrium in price okay now we're getting a few questions coming in okay hold off on the individual stock trades because people are asking I want to be able to get to everybody's questions regarding uh, trading in general and what's on the slides okay uh, money management Frenchie I'm gonna get to that in a minute actually we'll talk a little bit about, mo about money management hey Dave is there a big difference between oversold in an uptrend versus oversold a downtrend um, that's a good question. Is there a big difference between oversold and an uptrend and oversold and a downtrend? Well, if you're already in a downtrend and you get oversold, then you're super duper oversold because in general, the market has trended lower and it's headed down. When you see a market just absolutely implode, the old Wall Street adage is when it's time to buy, you won't want to. When it seems like the end of the world, if you go back to 2000, when was it, 2009, uh, right before the March bottom, everything just dropped like a rock. Uh, so is the difference between that and then the market that's oversold and an uptrend? Um, I don't really have an answer for you other than when it's oversold in an uptrend. Let's call it oversold in an uptrend, I in uptrend, O-S-I-U, oversold in uptrend. It might only be a correction, okay? 
But when it's oversold in a downtrend, you don't know if it's trend continuation or an exhaustion to the downside. But when it feels like the world's ending and you come in and your shorts are just absolutely printing money, I'm not saying bail out on everything, but if you haven't taken some profits and you're close to those profit targets or you're letting some profits ride uh, past the initial profit targets, I'm not saying bail out on everything, okay? What I am saying is use that as an opportunity to take a little money off the table. Like Linda Rasky used to say, feed the ducks while they're quacking, okay? When everybody in the world is selling like crazy, and you're already short, it's a good time to lighten up a little bit, provided you're still following the general plan of things, okay? As a general statement, in a rip-roaring bull market, I tend to th let things ride a little bit on the long side, okay? And on the short side, I tend to maybe let things ride a little bit more when the market is imploding on the short side, or going down, I should say, on the short side. But when that move becomes parabolic to the upside, or a market begins to melt down a little bit, and that oversold becomes extremely oversold, especially in a downtrend, then you might have a so-called spike type of bottom in the making. And again, don't bail out on all your positions. Keep some, just in case the world does end, and then you profit there. Of course, we'll have bigger problems if the market does completely come unglued, obviously. But at least you'll you'll do okay on that on the day that it does. But be willing to lighten up a little bit when oversold becomes oversold in a downtrend. And again, in an uptrend, it could only be a correction to a longer term trend. But we don't know if that's the beginning of a transition or not. If you go back a couple of weeks, or I guess a month ago, I said, guys, I'm a little worried we got a bow tie down from all-time highs in a couple of these indices, okay? And I hope it doesn't work. Well, it didn't work. The market turned right around and went right back up, and that's a good thing. That was a daily bow tie. We didn't get a weekly bow tie. If we get a weekly bow tie, I'm going to get a little bit more concerned. So, so far, so far, once we make it back to new highs, and I guess we have kind of marginally, that oversold condition is uh, can be seen as a correction, okay? Okay, I'll get to that, Fred. Just give me one second. You would not be looking to buy oversold in a downtrend. You would not be looking to buy oversold in a downtrend. No. No. Um, no, because... You might be looking to cover oversold in a downtrend because, like I just said, that everything is just such has reached such an extreme that everybody's running for the door at the same time, and that buying will exhaust itself. And, and you've, if you've been around long enough, and you have the luxury of watching the screen, which could also be to your detriment if you can watch the screen. But I've seen some of these sell-offs before where. And I don't watch it as much as I used to, but I used to watch all these market indicators. And you see the tick just go ridiculously high to the negative side. And you see all these market indicators just go to this, this levels that you haven't seen in 10 years. You know that it's probably exhausted itself and it's probably done. And then there's just a feel, a general feel, which is what I go off of more now, where you look at your screen and everything is just red and they're throwing the baby out with the bath water. Then that oversold condition is probably an extreme V type of bottom. Okay, now I'm not a big fan of the V type of bottom at high levels. Okay, but if you're in a downtrend, if you're in a downtrend and you get that V type of action, that's a different story because the market has been going, let's say it just goes down forever for years. Okay, and then you get this V type of action. Well, this market is so oversold longer term that even this tiny bit of overbought in here is not relative based on the fact that it's so oversold longer term. And this was a type of bottom we had in 2009. We had a V-shaped bottom. But when you're in an uptrend and you get this V-shaped recovery, I'm not as excited about that as I would be about this 
at low, low levels. Because you still, I guess you could argue, you still overbought from a longer term perspective, and then you're overbought from a shorter term perspective. And it's hard to launch that new leg on top of the old leg. And this is why I'm talking about the good thing is this market can just kind of walk off that overbought condition, then it has a potential to rally. Okay. To me, that's the difference. Um, okay, and that was the. I'm not sure what you're saying. Um, but yeah, I guess there is a difference between oversold and an uptrend and oversold and a downtrend. Okay. And conversely, overbought and an uptrend and overbought and a downtrend. Now, you have to take a consideration longer term overbought and longer term oversold. Don't think about it too much, okay? If you get first thrust, if you get bow ties, if you get reversal gaps, uh, and other patterns like that setting up, then go with them. Don't try to quantify and think about it too much, okay? Is pricing action in pre-market or after hours relevant? It's Okay, uh, good question, Fred. Uh, I'm going to answer out of both sides of my mouth. Yes and no, okay? Um, for the most part, you want to ignore it. But let's say you have the great fortune of, let's say you're in a little biotech stock, and you're blessed with an unbelievable gain in after-hours trading, provided it's a pretty liquid stock. And this doesn't happen that often. But it's okay, especially if you haven't hit that initial profit target just yet, and this thing is up huge, I mean like ridiculously huge in after hours trading. It's okay to lighten up a little bit during that euphoria because even if that trend continue, continues higher, it's less likely to continue higher at such a parabolic rate because everybody's trapped and they're looking to get out. For the most part, you want to ignore after hours trading, okay? and pre-market trading. Now, the only time you might want to look at pre-market trading is you're going to get into a position. Now, I don't I don't recommend putting in orders before the open anyway, but let's say you did, or you're going to put in maybe a contingency order before the open. You might want to look at that stock to see where it's bidding before the open. If it's bidding a couple of points of where you're above where your entry is, you might need to rethink your entry, and you might know that you have to use some discretion on it, okay? And I guess pre-market could also help to show you, hey, wait a minute, this stock is pretty close to that profit target. Let me make sure it doesn't reverse on the open so I can take those uh, profits, okay? Yeah, don't get too caught up in the pre-market and the post-market trading or after-hours trading, however you want to look at that, unless there's something that's uh, glaring that looks like it uh, needs to be done, okay? Okay, hopefully Howard answered your question. Would you trade Forex? Yes, I do. Um, I don't trade it a lot. Okay, I actually get dinged with uh, inactivity for not trading it enough. So every night I'll go in just because I'd rather I'd rather make a trade and have a chance of winning some money than get charged for not trading. So when forced to trade, yeah, I'll fire off a day trade or something in Forex. And sometimes it works out nicely, sometimes it doesn't. But the main way I would trade Forex or any other efficient market, and to those of you who went to my um, stock selection webinar, know that I spent a lot of time on this. We talked a lot of time about, uh, spent a lot of time talking about efficient markets. And Forex is going to be a lot more efficient market than uh, these little solar stocks or these little biotechs or these little gold stocks for that matter that we've been trading in here. And in, in a little while, I'm going to show you the portfolio, and you're going to see some pretty substantial moves. You're not going to get that kind of move in Forex. But if you want to trade Forex, then wait until the currency pair is making an all-time high or at least a multi-year high and beginning to make a transition, Okay. And if it's looking to make an all-time or at least a multi-year bottom, then look to play that transition. Look to play play the bow tie here. Look to play the bow tie there. Okay, and don't worry about the middle too much. Now I made it look like a straight line down. Okay, but it's not going to look like that. It'll probably look like this. You know, and don't get too caught up in that. But when it's way down here and it begins to make that turn, that's when the most people are going to be on the wrong side of the market. 
Someone asked me a couple days ago, hey, Dave, I see these bow ties work. Sometimes they work out well, and sometimes they don't work out so good. Any tips? And I said, yes, come to the chart show today, and I'm going to mention that. So I'm glad uh, you brought it up through Forex. So in an efficient market, I like to trade mostly transitions. And if you have time, go in and look at major bottoms in commodities or any other efficient market. I don't want to go off on a tangent on efficient markets because we talked about that for a long time in the webinar. But essentially, an efficient market is where you have a lot of players. you got producers, consumers, and speculators, and they're all kind of fighting it out. For the most part, the market tends to chop around. You don't get these these disequilibriums in prices, which create the opportunities. But in an inefficient market, you do. But inefficiencies can occur in efficient markets. And notice if you go into my website and read the GoGo Nomo strategy, uh, which is under education. And you'll see that that strategy ends up focusing mostly on efficient stocks. But we're looking for an inefficient move and efficient stock. Read the strategy, and you'll see how that works its way out. Okay. What are the advantages and disadvantages of trade forex? Well, leverage you have to be careful with. I would never see leverage as an advantage unless maybe you 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 have a fixed loss, like in an options. If you're creating some kind of options position where you have a fixed loss, um, so you got to look at how much money you could lose on a trade and don't worry about the leverage other than calculating what's the maximum amount you're willing to lose on that trade. So there's no advantage to trading Forex. I mean, liquidity, the liquidity can be nice. The lack of commissions can be nice. But trust me, they're making money off of you through the spreads and through the rolling and everything else, okay? Uh, very crowded market, very tough market to trade. Pick your spots very carefully, okay? Um, I would much rather trade a little gold stock that could go up a long, long time. Is your system working on forward? Yeah, it works. Yeah, my system works in all markets, in all time frames, okay? Does it work as good in an efficient, in an efficient market like the uh, S&P futures? But there are times where you could get, catch some wonderful trends um, on like a 60-minute chart. Sometimes the market will make up. I don't know for a fact. I mean, we could find out real quick. But I'd be willing to bet you we've got a 60-minute bow tie down. Boy, I'm going on, on a limb here. Let's take a look at the SPY. I'd be willing to bet. I wonder if it will go back this far. I'd be willing to bet we had a 60-minute bow tie down back there okay let's take a look at that just for s and g's and let's see what happened let's take a look at an hourly bow tie okay yeah look at that okay you had a uh, you had a bow tie down here on the 60 minute chart came back up one more time and then you had a bow tie down here and then you had this move from there to there okay you had a bow tie up here Okay, and then you had to move from there to there. Okay, so that's an hourly chart. I did not look at this chart before this presentation, but that shows you it can work at all time frames. Now, pick your spots carefully. Okay, when the market is severely oversold, like it was, or fairly oversold, like it was recently, and then you get a buy signal, then you know that maybe that reversion to the mean move has started. Now, this is not how I trade, it's not my way or highway, though. And that's the beauty of my methodology is that it can wor work in all markets and in all time frames. It's not a perfect methodology, and there are none, okay? But the imperfect nature of it, I think, is what makes it great. If, if it was perceived as the greatest thing to slice bread, then everybody would rush out and use it, and it would no longer work, okay? Hopefully that made some sense. Uh, let me just get through a slide or two, and we'll come back to your uh, questions. Uh, smoke them if you got them it was uh, where we were whoops, last week, and it was in this A and V, and it triggered here, and it ran up to here. We took partial profits, okay, and we had bumped up our stop to break even to save as the entry. I'll walk you through that last week, so see last week's webinar on that. Now, what happened this week? Well, yesterday, it stopped out, 
okay? Now, today it turned right back up, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that in just one second. But this is better than a poke in the eye trade. You made 50%. I'm sorry, you took 50% of profits here, and this was about a 20% gain, I think, 20 or 25% gain. I forget the exact numbers. So you can do the math if you want. 595 versus 495 is 1 divided by 495. I think it's about 25% round numbers. And then it stopped out. Well, just for S to G's this morning, I did the math on that. And if every trade rallied up in about two weeks, made 20, 25%, came right back in. Annualized, you'd make about 140% a year. So this is much better than a poke of the eye type of trade, or as my friends over in Italy call it, uh, medio di un bastone nel culo, which means better to stick in the butt. So I think, uh, I think our term is a little less, um, well, I don't know. <laughs> I probably shouldn't go there. But um, it just reminded me of that, and I know we got some uh, – some of my Italian brother, brethren are in here today. But um, it's better than a stick in the butt. It's better than a poke in the eye when you get that initial profit target and it comes back in. Now, one thing real quick, if we have a bunch of trades that do this, okay, up and down, up and down, up and down, as I often preach, everybody sends me an email and says, Dave, why don't we take 100% here? Well, we're not going for that little gain. We're not going for this little piece here. We're going for the big prize, the big piece here, which I'm going to show you in one minute. And conversely, when the market's doing pretty good and it kind of busts through this additional profit target keeps on going, everybody asks me, well, why don't we hold on to 100%? Well, because we don't know that it's going to do this and on which trades it's going to work out. Um, I have a pretty good idea. Every now and then I'll get just get my, my, as I said before, my pulse will quicken when I see a good-looking stock when I'm flipping through those charts at a million miles an hour and all of a sudden, whoa. That's the stock. And a lot of times that stock will work out, but sometimes it won't, okay? And that tempers my expectations to know that sometimes I can be wrong, okay? And if you feel like you could ever be wrong, get married, and, um, and you'll, you'll, you'll get reminded when you're wrong. <laughs> so, you can write a book, but you can't remember to take the garbage out. Um, I digress, okay? So you have to position yourself for both long-term and shorter-term gains, or better said, both short-term and longer-term gains. Now, if you take a look at the A and B longer-term, like I said last week, I was on a radio show, they said, give us a stock that'll go up 50 points. I said, A and B, okay? And the reason I said that was because it was 50-something points back here, okay? And my thinking is maybe, it, maybe just maybe, and it's a big baby, it has the potential to return to its old glory. Now, we just got knocked out. But this thing could set up again, and we might look to get back long. Some of my clients already are uh, getting back in, and that's fine. So the point is, I think this stock has much bigger longer-term potential. But what sometimes happens, even when a trend begins, the trends, unfortunately, don't just do like this. They just go along, you marry away, and you just follow them along with a big smiley face with a trailing stop. There's fits and starts. I think that's the right word and especially in something commodity-related. So that trend might look like this. Now, what we want to have happen is we want that stop to go from looking like this to looking like this, meaning that it's going to widen out a little bit. We've got to make this transition from short-term trading to longer-term trading. I know I've kind of beat the dead horse on this, but what happened with A and V was it stopped out before we could make that transition to a longer term trade. And it still turned out to be a pretty darn good, better than stick in the butt trade at 140% annualized. Okay. Um, maybe just comes to 10% overall, but still, still not bad return on that trade. Okay. So we're positioning ourselves. We want to capture that big longer term move, but sometimes it doesn't always happen, obviously. And sometimes you get stopped out as a loss, even uh, regardless of how great. A trade looks okay. Laugh a lot. That was funny. Marriage of being wrong. Yeah, it's 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 a very humbling experience. And I'm and I'm I, I'm happily married. I I can't imagine um, if you weren't. Um, okay. So has everybody got their head wrapped around the short-term mentality? But that short-term volatility, we're trying to ride out. 
if you were to look at short term volatility, the market can move so much over a short period of time, and it can move a lot more over a longer period of time. And that's why you've probably seen me do some presentations where I put a probability cone. Let's forget about this trading over here. And let's say you, you're in a market um, at this juncture here. If you did a probability cone, it's going to look like this. It's going to be like a parabola laying on its side. And the further out you go, the bigger that parabola is going to get. So if you're trying to gauge a short-term period, it could be so big. If you try to gauge a longer-term period, it's going to be much bigger. Now, sometimes we underestimate how much room we need over the short term, or the market just simply doesn't cooperate. Depends on how you want to look at it, whether the market's wrong or you wrong, or you're wrong, okay, in your volatility assessment. Because, again, all predictions are about the future. So in this particular case, the short-term volatility, we didn't have enough, a wide enough stop to ride the short-term volatility. It's so far, it's beginning to take off again. It's about right here today, okay? But I still think it has longer-term potential, and we're going to revisit that one. We're also looking at some other ones in here that I think have uh, potential too, okay? So anyway, I still think a major bottom's in place there. I still think a major bottom's in place in gold. Uh, we've been looking at the portfolio lately. Uh, the the gold stock, what was that, um, A and B just came out, and it came out as a 1,000% gain, and I'm sorry, a $1,000 gain and a zero gain on two sides of the loaf. Um, there's two loaves to each trade. Um, like I said last week, the question is, why do you divide it into two positions? Well, in this particular case, let's take a look at like LIOX. If I have just 2,000, if I'm looking at it as 2,000 shares of a stock on in the portfolio, in this spreadsheet, and the stock starts going up, I'm going to look at that whole position, and I'm going to be failed. I'm not going to be reminded of the fact that we have two ways we play. We play our trading loaf, and we play our trending loaf. But by dividing it into a couple of loaves, it makes it easier to see. And this is kind of cool. I call this black and white. White means you take partial profits, okay? And then black, I'm sorry. White means you take partial profits because I just take. I don't highlight the position once it hits the partial profit. Uh, by the way, this one's getting kind of close for those of you who are long tan. Uh, we're getting kind of close to that 48 today. We're within a point, you know, that, that stock. That stock can move a point pretty quickly. So be looking to take partial profits on that. But anyway, black and white. Black meaning in the black, and white meaning we've taken partial profits. And if you look at the black here. This is um, this is a thing of beauty. You don't always see this, okay? We've got eight out of eight stocks that are in the black, okay? So that's 100% winners, and that's a nice thing to have. Um, now, am I bragging? No. I would much rather be wrong and make more money because, like I often say, people would rather be right than make money. I'm glad I'm right. Don't get me wrong. But notice we don't really have that many big outliers in here. We only got about 2,000 in this one here, okay? What I like is I like an outlier like that where you're up about 28000 or $30,000 on a trade, okay, as opposed to just up one or 2K. So I'm not upset with this, but I'd much rather be have more bigger outliers that make more money than – the accuracy. The accuracy does not bother me one way or the other, okay? But yeah, I know, I'm showing you, it's there, okay? But this is a rare, this is results not typical. You don't always get 100% accuracy. In fact, if you hit around 50% and hit a couple of winners here and there, you, you're you going to do incredible longer term. So don't get too caught up in the statistics of things. But people often ask me, what's what's going on? This is this is the actual portfolio uh, of my trading service, okay? Now, let's see. Okay, John, I'm not going to answer that question because that's set up for today. Is this Rorschach test? Looks like a pair of Loch Ness Monsters to me. One of yours has its shadows, perhaps. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, um, yeah, the things get a little messy in this drawing. 
it's like whenever I log on to post my market in the minute every morning, I guess I must have at some point in my life clicked on some video out of boredom, but they recommend the most bizarrest videos for me. It's like weathermen drawing weather patterns that end up looking very phallic and all kinds of weird stuff. So I made the mistake of clicking on that, I guess at one point in my career. <laughs> and now every morning as I'm uploading the market in the minute, Dave, I think you would like this video. <laughs> so... But, um, yeah, I just got to thinking about that when I was drawing those lines. And make sure I'm not drawing anything that looks kind of bizarre. Uh, we got kind of bizarre last week, as you know. Uh, Art, um, do you have a favorite broker or trading stocks, options, futures, and Forex? Um, I have some people that I use. I'm also affiliate with one broker. So uh, email me offline if you're – but here's the thing. Uh, the playing field has pretty much been leveled from what I've seen back in the 80s and 90s. Um, it was just abysmal. You had you had the expensive brokers, which had ridiculous expense, uh, commissions, just unbelievably expensive. And you had some cheaper ones, and the cheaper ones gave you really crappy fills. And I had... Um, Oh, I don't know, fifty dollars in commissions on a trade, which seems would seem incredible. And a friend of mine who entered the same trade at the same time had uh, like twenty dollars in commissions, but his slippage was two hundred and fifty dollars. So who came out ahead? I paid more in commissions, but he paid a lot more in uh, in flesh, a pound of flesh, right? Um, but you don't have that problem anymore. The playing field has been leveled. If you're trading my methodology, it's not that crucial. Uh, you could be a little sloppy in your execution. Not that you don't want to be, but if you're sticking with the major brokerages, meaning that you heard of the broker's name before, you'll do just fine uh, with that. Okay? If she comes with the trade. <laughs> uh, that opens up some jokes. You can't see the whole questions. <laughs> so. All right, pressure's off. Uh, I've been talking about this for a few weeks now. And it's been mostly in terms of the overall market. But judging from human nature and the emails I've been seeing, I want to kind of elaborate a little further on that. But for now, just for a second here, let's just talk about this real quick, and then we'll move on. Uh, don't feel like you need to be like, oh, it's a bull market. Oh, it's a bear market. And you have to label yourself and figure that out. As I've talked about recently, and, and again, results not typical. I'll probably temper things too much um, because I want everybody's expectations to be tempered. In longer term, they're going to be pleasantly surprised. But over the short term, things obviously can go wrong. But what was kind of cool lately is the market sold off and our longs went up in spite of the market for the most part. And the portfolio went up in spite of the market. Now, we didn't have that many shorts working that actually worked out. And then when the market went up, we had some shorts that actually continued to work, even though the market was going up. And we had some that did not. But in the longs, some longs gave it up a little bit. Some other longs picked up the slack. Net, net throughout the entire slide. And, again, this is the worst thing that could happen for a trend follower is they have a short V type of pattern occur, but we actually made out okay. Now, if we would have bailed out on everything when, as soon as the things got a little dicey, we would have ended up losing money during this period of time. Now, I'm not saying it can't be painful because it can, but you don't want to try to guess that market top and you could get hurt in doing that. So don't put that pressure on yourself. Realize you're dealing with an imperfect world when it comes to trading. Let the ebb and flow control your portfolio. All these things I preach every week in here. Let those stops take you out of your stinkers. Let them take you out of your positions. It's okay to use a little discretion here and there and let things maybe go a little bit further within reason. For instance, on maybe on the, you know, the A&V trade, that's kind of a tough call. But you could say, well, I'm still profitable overall. Maybe I'll give it a little bit more room, okay? But if it comes down and just nicks a stop, it's okay to use a little discretion there. But as far as predicting the overall market and trying to get that right 
and trying to say, we're in a bull market, we're in a bull market, bull market, we're in a bear market, bear market, bear market. Forget about that. Just let the ebb and flow control your portfolio. Now, the most common email I get is, or emails, is what should I do with this stock? What should I do with this stock? Well, my answer is always, let me see your plan. What was your original plan? Let's follow your original plan. You know what the answer is? Well, I don't have one. Well, uh, I don't have a plan. Okay, well, what's the old cliche? He who fails to plan, plans to fail. You need to have a plan going in. As I say and preach over and over again, beating a dead horse here, obsess before you get into a trade, not afterwards. Is the stock trending? Are other stocks in the sector trending? Is the sector trending? Is the stock set up? Does the stock trade cleanly? Okay. We're about, uh, what's 6 plus 8? That's uh, 14, if my math is correct. We're 14 hours into this stock selection webinar series, okay, on how to pick the best stocks. But all of that is before you get into the trade. It's not a money management webinar. It's not a position management webinar. It's how to pick the best stocks. So learn how to pick the best stocks. Pick the best, leave the rest. I know it's cliche, but obsess before you get into that trade, not afterwards. Okay, so if you plan your trade, and I put a couple little things in the background here, and it's kind of like this where to get in. Well, that's assuming that you didn't follow the plan, and now you're trying to catch up to something that's already taken off. Okay, so all of this stuff is after the trade. I should make that kind of clear in here. Believe it or not, I'll get this email a few times a year. I'm down 50 points. Now what? Well, that kind of move can put a pretty big dent in your account, okay? So try to, don't try to, just do it. Plan your trade and trade your plan, and then you won't go through all this stuff in your head. Am I right? Am I wrong? Should I buy more? Why is it going down? I wish I would have bought more. Just say, okay, I'm going to trade 2% of my account if stopped out. This market's fairly volatile. I better give it, I don't know, I better give it two points of room, okay? Let's say you got a 100K account, so it's going to be, two. you got $2,000 to allocate. If stopped out, divide that by two. So you're going to buy what? You're going to buy 1,000 shares. You're going to buy them where? Well, you got your little pullback, okay? You're going to buy them if it hits that level. Okay, where are you going to sell? Well, I'm going to sell. A, I'm going to sell 500 shares at this level here, and then I'm going to trail my stop, and I'm going to slowly loosen it up. That's my plan. It took me one minute to say all this. Okay, and that's all you have to do: plan a trade and trade to plan. If you can't do that, then do it on one trade and see what happens. Then do it on another trade and see what happens. Until you get to the point where you're repeating it over and over. And then you don't end up with all this. And I, I can't, I don't have a proper way of saying this. That's uh, PG-13. But you don't en end up with all this in your head where you're going through all these things and all this second guessing and this constant little record that's playing over and over in your head of all these things. As I've said quite often, if you trade properly, at least with my system, it's going to be a little bit boring, okay? It's not going to be excitement. If you want some excitement, go out and get you, uh, you married guys, go out and get you a girlfriend. That, there you go. It'll probably be cheaper in the long run than to, um, than to trade without a plan, okay? Obviously, I'm joking on that. In fact, I would I'd appreciate if more of you guys would uh, stop getting girlfriends. So I I lose half my clients to divorce. Okay, <laughs> maybe sometimes it's ladies' fault too. You ladies, okay, behave. <laughs>
All right, a couple of random thoughts. Uh, again, you know, most of these left in from the last couple of weeks. Just take things one day at a time. We're overbought now, but hey, market could still go higher. Okay, market could sell off. Who who cares? So what? If you like a setup, then take it. Take it one setup at a time. Let the market come to you. Uh, I'm seeing a few nice looking gold stocks setting up today. Maybe some of which I'll share with you. Some of which I can't because they're in my service. Um, and we're going after some of those. Okay, at least one in particular for today. But I haven't seen a whole lot else I want to buy lately. But if things continue to improve, maybe we will. And we'll talk about the market here in just one minute. Continue to play that good offense. I cannot, as I said, last few months in here or since the beginning of the year, my goal for 2014 is to be the best stock picker that I can. So far, so good. Knock on wood. Um, as I've talked about before, you want to have a deliberate practice where each day you're looking at your charts, you're working, you get better and better. I don't want to get mamby pamby on you. Okay, it's kind of like a it's a Geico commercial. Why Pinocchio is not a good motivational speaker? You know, I see potential in you and you and you, but I don't get mamby pamby on you. And get into the fluff, but if you do work at it and deliberately practice, you will get better and better and better. And, and you know, I don't want to say every day and every way I'm getting better and better and get off on some sort of tangent like that. But the bottom line is if you are looking at the stocks, don't deal in mediocrity. Make sure you've got a trend or good transition in trend. Make sure you've got a very good setup. Make sure that setup is backed by similar setups within the sector. Make sure nothing within the sector is even better. Dot all your I's, cross all your T's, make sure you got the best of the best, and then go for it, okay? So play that good offense, and be selective. You can't stand it, trade, all right? We had a few days last week where there were no setups, and you know what? I don't care. I'm, I'm not going to be pressured to take the setup if there's nothing there, and that takes a long time to learn. All right, a few questions in here. <laughs> Jonathan said, damn, stepped away for a second. Can you run through the plan you trade, trade your plan, two-minute diversion? Uh, no, John, there's not enough time for that. So it's too bad these things aren't recorded. Okay. How to set the initial profit target for when? Uh, when read, read layman's in there. Uh, basically, you're eyeballing the market. If a market's bouncing around two and three points a day, your stop needs to be outside of that normal noise, maybe five points in that particular case, and then your initial profit target from your entry is going to be the same distance, okay? See all the old webcasts. Get the flash drives. I'm telling you, a lot of good information in those flash drives, if I say so myself. A couple of announcements in here. Uh, stock Selection Webinar is available. Just see my website, and right here on the website, Stock Selection Webinar. And this is kind of cool. These are the, um, and I'll have to update the spreadsheet, but these are the moves that the stocks we picked during the webinar uh, have moved from uh, without using any money management at all, just measuring the high closes in here. And it's been pretty cool uh, type of deal. Obviously, you would want to use money. You would want to use money management, but if you use none whatsoever, that's pretty cool to show you what's possible. Um, if you want the webinar, go to that page, and then uh, six months of the trading service come with that. Free. I have the second volume of the Week of Charts where we cover, if you look at my website and you look at all the things that are covered in the Week of Charts, that's, that's probably the most bang for the buck right there in the flash drives. My first two books are still relative. Uh, relative? Relevant. They're related to one another. They're still rel relevant. I get a lot of questions on, um, uh, on, on that all the time. Yes, make sure you read layman's, though. In fact, I'd actually suggest you work in reverse chronological order. Read layman's and then read the other two um, on here. Um, I won't make, I'll make like six bucks on layman's and I'll make more money on the ebooks. Uh, so it doesn't really bother me. But I'm telling you flat out, you want to read the last one first. And then there's still a lot of good information in those other books. So make sure you read them all. Um, if you do want both of them, since you're here at the webinar, say hook me up, Dave. I'll make you a good deal on uh, on both of them together. Uh, service. I have a trading service, $49 intro rate, and I think everybody here knows about that. That spreadsheet that I show quite often, that's where it comes from. Okay. A couple of questions in here, and then we're going to get to the overall market. 
Okay, uh, John, this comes up over and over again. Uh, this is a, this is another question on saying to stop. But it said my stop was set at URZ at 110. How did I set this stop? Okay. Well, if you look at URZ, it's a uranium stock. It's a fairly volatile stock. That seems like an extreme type of stop. But given the nature of the commodity and the nature of the market. Uh, that's what that stock requires. And I know in that particular case, percentage-wise, it gets out of whack on these cheap stocks, okay? Um, but that's what it required, and that's what uh, that's what we use, just like a fairly big stop on the NG in here percentage-wise, okay? So it depends on how much the market moves around, okay? And you could just eyeball it. If it's bouncing around two and three points a day, or in case of some of those little volatile, low-level, as I called them recently in the column, those pigs beginning to fly, those low-level stocks, they're bouncing around 10, 15 percent a day, maybe more, then your stop is going to have to be outside of that levels. Why did I do a layman's ebook? Well, I don't. I'm not the publisher of layman's. Um, I, I might do that at some point. Um, I haven't fully thought about it. If you do an ebook through Amazon, it just doesn't work. Something like a, a novel, it works because you sell a million novels. Uh, trading books, you sell a couple of thousand trading books. And the amount of time and energy and effort that goes in, it's not worth selling it for the way Amazon model works for $9 a book. I mean, you might as well just give it away. So that's why I don't have a Kindle version uh, of it. I'm not completely uh, opposed to that but um, you know maybe someday there'll be a, a electronic version what I had been doing or have been doing if you buy the hardcover version and you email me on the honor system and say Dave I bought your layman's book um, I really need a, 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 a you know I they looked at me funny when I was on the plane with a with a hard book the other day so uh, I'd love to have it on my Kindle or my um, iPad or whatever or tablet. So hook me up with a PDF. And you know what? Big Dave will do that for you. I'll hook you up. So if you want the ebook, just get the hardcover and I'll, and I'll um, get the ebook from you. All right, fantastic. <laughs> yeah, it's like you see somebody in a plane, they have like a book, and you're like, what's that? And usually that's me. <laughs> <laughs> with a with an actual book on a plane, you know, like what is that thing? It looks funny. Is that paper? I haven't seen that in a while. Okay, um, let me hop into the overall market, and uh, we'll come back to some of these questions. Uh, plenty of questions stacking up in here. Good, thank you. I'm excited that you guys are asking questions. All right, let's start with the peas, and then we'll work our way out. Oh, by the way, again, like somebody asked me uh, about the bow ties, this bow tie here is more significant than this one. Okay, even though this one's a little sloppy for them, that's not the reason I'm saying that. This is a high-level bow tie, or I should say a mid-level bow tie. It's within the trend or sideways movement, however you want to look at it. Whereas this one, it's coming off of all-time highs. Okay, so that's the that's the bow tie you want to trade in Forex, the one coming off of all-time highs or all-time lows, and not get as excited about those that happen mid-trend. Now, with that said, it's like the bow tie didn't really follow through too much before the market reversed. And that's fine with me. I don't care. In fact, the bow tie actual trigger would have been like right on right around here. Uh, it using a liberal trigger, you may not have um, gone with it. Not that I recommend trading uh, indices with bow ties, but anyway, because it's a more efficient market. Uh, anyway, the P's are just kind of walking off so far that overbought condition. The good news is they're just shy of all time highs. So I'm not that excited about rushing out to short stocks while the market is making new highs. A couple of weeks ago, different picture, market rolling over, looking like the end of the world. But we didn't know that. We certainly didn't know it would come right back up. But you play the hand that's dealt. A couple of weeks ago or a month ago, it was like, okay, it looks like the short side's the way to play. Let's put some shorts on. And thank goodness the market came back. Uh, you know me. I'm happy. I'd rather the market just, uh, I'd rather just play the long side. Okay. Bow ties look a little bit differently. 
in the P's. Your first thrust cell signal would have been here. Your bow tie, I guess, would have been here. Cell signal would turn right back up. Hey, protector stops in every trade, right? Um, ideally, I'd like to see the P's bust out the new highs and not look back. Um, and then maybe have some early corrections along the way. We still have this V-shaped recovery at high levels, as I've been preaching in nausea. By the time the market gets to this overbought, it's hard for a new leg to bounce. Uh, I'm sorry to uh, build on that old leg. But, hey, if this thing starts going sideways in here, as I said earlier, it can walk off that oversold, I'm sorry, the overbought condition. Let's take a look at the quack. And then uh, if you guys want to start asking about individual issues, uh, let's we can start now because we'll be there in a few minutes. Um, NASQAC. Same sort of uh, sideways action, mostly, lately. Uh, I don't like the drift too much in here. I like to see some acceleration higher or maybe a down correction before it takes off. Uh, but you certainly can't argue with multi-year highs. As long as it's at multi-year highs, it's not complaining too much. But it is a little dangerous environment to buy into. Sector action is we're looking pretty good. Drugs uh, pull back a little bit. I don't have my charts updated for today, but uh, drugs pulled back a little bit yesterday. Um, so far, a nice breakout remains intact there. Civis made new highs yesterday. So far, a nice breakout remains intact there. Technology in general, as you would expect with the NASDAQ at new highs, is actually doing pretty good. Where's electronics? There it is, okay? So, so far, so good there. Uh, yeah, some of these markets a little overbought. Some of these markets like retail, Coming back with a vengeance. Uh, look at that pushing into this overhead resistance, and they're catching up on their V's. Uh, chemicals are now catching up on its V, and now chemicals have made it to new highs. So, still a dangerous environment, but a lot of areas as each day goes by, a lot of areas improving. Gold and silver remain two of my favorites out there. There's gold, you can see uh, probably bow tie down. Yeah, bow tie down here from these multi, multi year lows. And silver made a similar type of move, looking pretty good. So overall, things still look pretty good. There's your silver stocks. Now, silver's going to be a little bit more wilder and crazier, but so far, so good on silver. Let's take a look at silver, the commodity in here. Uh, yesterday, it had a pretty big correction. Uh, today, it's stabilizing a little bit. But as you can see, uh, bow tie here. I guess this would sort of be your first entry here. This is why I still think that silver has a long ways to go gold, and so as does gold. Uh, EFA shares, foreign shares, recently broke out to all-time high, or, I'm sorry, multi-year highs, pull back a little bit, coming back a little bit today. So maybe everything is okay in the world. A couple of more sectors here, manufacturing have been rallying back up to complete that V like the overall market. Again, little dangerous, little, little um, iffy to jump in with both feet on the long side or short with both uh, you know what, as we said last week, <laughs> uh, that's probably not funny unless you were actually here last week, um, or buy with both. Uh, so be careful. I, I like, again, those gold and silvers. One, they can trade contra to the overall market. Two, they're at low levels. Uh, yeah, uranium has been taken off. That's correct. I've been a, a big bull on uranium. We have a uranium stock, as you know, in the portfolio. Let's take a look at URA, okay? Uh, nice little breakout there today, notwithstanding, coming in a little bit. But you can see uranium um, has been doing really well. Uranium is just kind of a, what does Colvell call it, a bouncing Bracco. It's just going to be, it's one of those trends that's going to be really hard to hold on to. But gosh, when it works, it's just going to be a, a thing of beauty. I think that URZ has tremendous potential. Okay. Um, Biotech, like drugs, doing pretty good. Pulled back a little bit yesterday. What's it doing today? It's up a little bit. Okay. Okay, let me uh, let me do a quick update. I'm going to answer some questions while I'm waiting on this. Uh, usually I try to get this before the show, but it's it runs a little slower without an update. Okay. Uh, Lewis, I'm not going to like that stock. It's been going down forever. Okay, let's see. Nice jump in uranium. I'm interested in how you spotted the bottom and your entry as I missed it. I never really saw a good entry, a nice bow tie at the bottom. 
well, we're waiting for charts now, obviously. Um, but uranium overall, you have like the URA, which is uranium stocks, made a nice little bottom and made a nice little bow tie. And that's how I began to get excited in uranium. And then the URZ um, bottomed out. It began to rally off of its lows. It was also off of major, major lows. Uh, uranium, it's kind of like, it's well, gold's doing the same thing, too, in silver. But I was going to say uranium is like these alternate energy stocks, like solar stocks. Take a look at, like, SPWR was up at, like, 50 bucks a share, and then it comes down and bottoms out around three, four, five bucks a share. And then we get a bow tie, and then we get a setup on it to go long. If you go back in, for instance, uh, A and V is a great example in here. Okay, the question is, how do I know bottom was in place? Well, if you go look at the A and V, well, you've got these all-time lows in here, okay? And then you've got a bow tie, okay? And then if you zoom in, you had a setup. You've got a nice... Now, this is pretty persistent for gold. Now, we talked about persistent pullbacks where you could draw a line through as many bars as possible, and that line is quite linear, okay, like linear regression. It's almost a perfect little line higher, even kind of just like this. And if you, you can see, so we know it's a pretty good trend. We know we got a bow tie back here, so we take a little pullback. Now, that's A and V, but uranium stocks did something very similar, okay. I'm going to go ahead and hop out to, um, I think we covered enough sectors and all, so let's hop out to the stocks. Now, keep in mind that something like URZ and these uranium stocks are going to be a little wild and crazy in here, okay? So I'm willing to live, it's got to like know the nature of the beast, but like URZ, you can see, came down here, made these all-time lows, and then it bow tied off those lows, and then we looked to play uh, pullbacks along the way. Okay, so that's what was going on with the URZ. Let me see what was the what was the entry on that one. One sixty. I gotta put the date in here. Um, so yeah, like triggered on this day here. Came down, triggered right in here, and it didn't do a whole lot, but now it's begun to take off. As you can see, take a look at like CGJ. Now, this one's all over the place, but it's taken off in here. It's another uranium stock. URA is the ETF, okay? And again, it's a little sloppy. Get, don't get me wrong, but with these uranium stocks bottom out and then begin to take off, it's uh, to the moon, Alice. Okay, Sharon says FXY, which is the Japanese yen, I believe. Uh, yeah, daily bow tie of multi-year lows, not weekly bow tie yet, okay? Yeah, if you think a look at the weekly, and if you go back into my webinars that I did in 2000, and Sharon, you might enjoy this, um, I think if you go in my 2012 webinars, I talked about the top in the yen back then, okay? And the reason I did was because we had a weekly bow tie signal way back here. And the shorting yin yen was just a tremendous opportunity. Now, of course, it didn't go straight down. It went kind of sideways in here for quite a while. But even if you don't directly trade these transitional patterns off of all-time highs or, let's say, five- or ten-year highs, it pays to pay attention to them because you could say, wait a minute, I think this market has topped I just got to figure out where I'm going to get in, okay? Now, if you could take the bow tie and put your stop up here above the high of the move and then forget about it, then that's fine. If you could stomach such a big move or if you have a um, big enough, uh, take a small enough position, okay, then you could do those kind of things, okay? So that was the top there. Just like in bonds, um, I got bearish. Oh, I'm not bonds. Well, bonds too, but gold. Sharon, I promise we'll get back to that one. Um, but we knew the top was in bonds way back here because we bow tied down, had that retrace in here. 
Okay, I'm sorry, I keep saying bonds. I mean gold. So we knew the top was a gold based on this transitional pattern, but it was a little hard to trade on the downside because it wasn't very clean. So if you know the top's in place, then you know that you know where you want to be. Just like right now, you never know for sure, but come on, guys. You got a double bottom in here. You got a bow tie in here, so it looks like the bottom is in place in gold. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. If I get stopped out of everything tomorrow, well, maybe it's too early to brag just yet, but yeah, I think so. I think I got profits on most every all my goals. If I got stopped, yeah, if I got stopped, if I got stopped out of everything tomorrow on the goals, you know what? It would have been a worthwhile venture, like I showed you just a minute ago. Annualized, it's 140 percent gain. Now, what what kind of gain am I going for? I'm going for a hundred thousand percent gain. Okay, I'm serious. You got to shoot for the moon. Okay, but be happy. I'll shoot for the stars. But be happy if you just get to the moon. Right? That's better than a poke in the eye. All right, let's uh, get back to FXY on the short term. Yeah, Sharon, good eye. Um, you're going to have some overhead resistance in uh, this currency, as you can see, because it did go sideways for quite a while. The good news is it might be worthwhile trading up until that level. I mean, if you get in this currency. If you get a setup and it goes from 95 up to 100, then um, fine. That's fine with me. What you might want to do, you Forex guys out there and gals, is take a look at some pairings against the Japanese yen. I'm not going to get into that um, in this webinar. Maybe someday I'll show you some of these things. But take a look at the pairings. If you trade Forex, you know what I'm talking about. And just know that you want the yen to be on the short side of the trade and you want to be long the other currency in the pair. But yeah, absolutely, Sharon. That looks like a, a bottom in the works because you had this major low here and then you get a low below the low. Okay. That's one of my favorite double bottoms is when you have that bottom below the prior bottom because that makes the most that traps the most people on the wrong side of the market. Why did you wait until 160 to get in your Z? Well, because they had a lot of fluff in the stock. And if you go in and look at I don't know if I made this chart public or not. It was the last time this stock actually set up. I wonder if I have that. If I could find that for you quickly. Let me see something here. I wonder if I could find that stock. It's a great question. I think I've got a couple examples in layman's too. And, and I think even my hypothetical example where I just drew the chart myself, I made it look like, um, I made it look like, the um, you should there should have been a way to get in earlier, but there there's not always a way to get in earlier, because you want to look for that perfection when you're going into a stock. Let's see if I could find it in here. This was uh, a story I was telling. Doing a speaking engagement. Okay. Um, this, I think this is URZ back here. This is something I'm writing about. Okay, URRE, another uranium stock. Well, if you look back here, you're probably thinking, well, maybe we could have gotten in here or, maybe, or somewhere else, but you had a lot of over -suppl overhead supply at those junctures, and this stock had actually gone up significantly before I actually took the trade because I was trying to avoid the overhead supply. So that's a good example of uranium and looking for that particular entry. Now, in this particular case, uh, if you would have gotten in here, that's fine, but you got to realize you had a lot of overhead supply, and then when it uh, set up subsequently to that level, I thought it was worth a shot, okay? Now, uranium stocks are probably not the best stocks to be talking about if you want to learn how to pick the cleanest stocks because you're going to have to be a little bit more lenient when it comes to those stocks. So the reason I show you that chapter from the book is that um, you're not always going to get in earlier. The stock actually more than doubled before we even had a setup in it, okay? Now, sometimes you get a nice transitional setup and it's clear. You got clear air above it. Then, by all means, go with it. Um, yeah, I mean, take a look at A and V. Okay, you're able to get in around five and change, I think was the entry on that one. Okay. As opposed to waiting for it to rally further up because you really didn't have a lot of overhead supply back here. And by the time you got to that level around five, you had already cleared all this resistance. Okay. 
Remember, if you buy a market below supply, when the market gets to that supply, there's a good chance that it's going to run into some trouble. Celia, I think I'm hoping they're saying that right, uh, wants to know about OIH. That's going to be like oil service something. Um, uh, no, I don't think I would do anything here. I'm not a big fan of, of ETFs unless it's like a, a GDXJ or a URA or a TAN, something that's a little bit more higher in your volatility. Notice it has an HV of about 17. Let's see what the spiders are. 13 or 11? 13, okay. So it's not much more volatile than the overall market. It has bow tied up, but this is a high level bow tie. I'm sorry. Yeah, this is like a, I'm sorry, mid level bow tie. Whereas this bow tie here was coming off all time highs. You, you might have gotten a little ride down in that when energy's rolling over with everything else, by the way. Um, I would leave it alone. Um, I think you'd be better off looking for maybe some all-service stock versus the all-service holders, okay? MPAA for Mr. John. MPAA. Um, a little thin, not crazy thin. My only problem with this one is it might be priced for perfection. Motor park cards are auto parts, okay? They're not splitting the atom, so to speak. So... They're making auto parts, which is it's which is a worthwhile venture, okay? But it's gone up about oh I don't know five hundred percent round numbers. So one has to wonder how much more it has to go. Now it has pulled back. I can't argue with the setup though. It's broken out of a base. You got a nice gap. You got to pull back. It's almost high five worthy, okay? So I'll give you an okay on that one. Uh, it is, it has gone up significantly, significantly already. I think it could work out, but my only thing I could pick it apart is two things. One, obviously the market's overbought. I'm not going to say that on every setup from now on, but just keep that in the back of your mind. And number two, it has gone a long way. It has gone a long ways. It might be priced for perfection. I think I did a whole webinar just on that. But when it's by the time the market, this market gets all the way up here. Everybody in their brother has now seen that setup or has seen this stock, and one has to wonder who's left to buy, okay? But certainly not a bad setup in and of itself. MGN for Mr. Phil. Good to see you, Phil. How are things over there across the pond? A uh, little on the thin side, so be careful there. It's already broken out of its pullback, so good eye on that. He's probably already long knowing Phil. Uh, Wait for the next pullback, and then it does have some bad memories here and there, but not too bad. So wait for the next pullback on that one. Steve says, does the gap, good to see you, Steve, does the gap up on Pan W and subsequent pullback concern you, or could it be a TKO setup if it pulls back and then accelerates higher? Let's take a look at it, Pan W, P-A-N-W. Okay. Um... No, it's not that extreme of a gap, okay? Uh, I get asked all the time and quite often in these presentations. And this is why I'm such, I know it sounds crazy, a fan. I know it sounds a little egotistical, a fan of my own work. But I just think the flash drives are just a cool thing because you guys draw me out on so many subjects and one of those subjects is gaps and if you just have a small gap it's no big deal in the, the small relative to the issue now if this stock gaps from 45 to 95 overnight then yeah stay away from it but no the size of the gap doesn't bother me here but it does need more TKO based on the magnitude of the move okay so it have to pull back a little bit more somewhere between 70 and where it is now Okay, rare sloppy pullback. All right, Kurt. Hey, Kurt. Good to see you, man. Kurt, is this the first show you've been to? I've never seen you in here. All these uh, people or, or um, clients, and, and I know most of you guys personally. Um, yeah, this looks pretty good. This is one. This is an IPO. It's on my list. I like to see it pull back a little bit more before going after it. Um, 
The only problem is I like the IPOs that come in at a little bit lower price and make a bigger percentage move. But I certainly can't argue with this stock if it pulls back a little bit in here. Okay. Just a quiet guy. All right, good. No problem, Kurt. Um, yeah, Kurt's been with me for years through thick and thin. Thank you, Kurt. I appreciate that. Uh, JCP for Lewis. I'm not going to like it. I can tell you right now. This is JC Pennies. Okay. It's gapped off its lows, but it's going to have a lot of problems. Okay. And boy, I tell you, that's a market. That's a market telling people to. Um, I know some people are holding on to JC Penny forever, and it's like there's the market all of a sudden giving them hope. That's 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 how the market's a bad teacher. Um, maybe if it clears this overhead supply, yeah, it could possibly set up as a transitional pattern. I'm just not interested in bottom fishing in uh, retail stocks at this juncture. EXK, EXK is going to be a silver stock. Yeah, I like it. I do. You got a bow tie here coming off of multi-year lows. Oh, I like it a little bit better for coming off of even longer term lows, but I hear you. It's still several years coming off of its low. Let's put the bow tie back in. Yeah, I think it, I think it can do okay. I think you might be able to find something at a little bit lower levels just beginning to take off, but I certainly can't argue with that one. Okay. Uh, live, that's a wild and crazy one. The volatility is going to be too high on that one. I've been looking at it, but it's, the volatility is 202. That's just ridiculous. Uh, it's going up a thousand, no, 1100 percent, 1200 percent. Okay, so it's just too dangerous now. Be careful on that one. GPL, full disclosure, I'm actually long that stock. Okay. That is the best looking stock I have ever seen in my entire life. Okay? Sell everything. Put every see this is a case where you don't even need a stop. It looks so good. So just sell everything, put all your money into the stock. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, next one. No, I'm just kidding. Uh no, it looks good though. Still looks good. Uh you got a major now this is a little penny stock, a little speculative stock. Okay, so be careful. Don't come crying to me when you lose all your money, but I still think you know, as people say, in my opinion, well, do you give opinions for others? But in, in my opinion, um, I think this is a stock that's bottom, has nice run off its lows. It's kind of a Phoenix stock. It was up at uh, quite higher levels in here. I think it might be able to return to its old glory, and that's why I like it so much. Okay, I think it looks good. A uh, little choppy in this little setup here. Not exactly set up yet. Um, ideally, I like to see it pull back a little bit more, but it's hard to get perfection sometimes in these gold stocks. RGLD, RGLD. Please don't put all your money on one stock. Remember, this is for educational purposes only. Read all disclaimers. In case of rash, discontinue use. If you smoke after sex, you're doing it too fast. You know all those other disclaimers. I stole that one from Tom McClellan. <laughs> yeah, that presentation. Um, yeah, you had your bow tie back here, your nice little run, maybe on a pullback, okay? Uh, right now, I like the lower-tiered gold stocks as represented by GDXJ, okay? You can see, and this is the record, This is like these beat-up little cheap junior gold miners, okay? Uh, get a, uh, what do you call it, thing? a prospectus on this off the Internet, and you'll see what it's all about. Uh, so as opposed to those higher level ones, I like the GDXJ. Um, I think that I, I hate to use the word investment, but I think GDXJ could almost be an investment. I think it's a, a longer term bottom there and has potential to run. Okay, um, AUMN. I'm going to like. Uh, looks good. Uh, you had the nice little bow tie back here. It does have some overhead supply to it. Um, if you ask you about, keep in mind, guys, a lot of these gold stocks you're going to ask about, I'm not going to be able to talk about because most of them, or not most of them, quite a bit, bit of them are on my list. I've never heard of this stock, Bluebird. Uh, maybe if it could continue to follow through and make a pullback. In general, it's been pretty choppy in here. It is a thinner stock, but yeah, it would have to rally up to maybe 30 or more and then pull back on that one, but thanks for bringing it to my attention. I'll keep that one on my list. KOG, um, no, because it's it's like a high level bottom. 
Um, I'd much rather a commodity-related stock like this coming off of major lows or major highs. But um, you probably could go, let's see, we don't have time, but if you jump to the sub-industry, you probably would be able to find something um, better. YOD for Mr. Andre. No, uh, the problem with YOD is, and this is something that came up in a stock selection webinar, is not to soft sell that, but it did come up quite a bit, is um, it's what I call a, bo uh, a bottle rocket. A bottle rocket like, takes off and it comes right back in, and it looks like a stock that's just shot straight higher that has the potential to possibly come right back in, okay? How about DNN on a pullback? All right, Ken, let's see. Uh, well, you've got... It's a little bit too big of a breakout on that one. Uh, I think you might, yeah, yeah, it's okay. And it's made the mother of all bases in here. I hear you. Yeah, maybe on a pullback, that would be worthwhile. Uh, again, with these commodity-related stocks, I'm a little bit more lenient than any other ones. Pause, pass overhead supply, and retesting breakout here. Yes. Um... Yeah. Yeah, you're not going to get perfection in these. Um, and that looks good. That looks good, Phil. You got a little tiny gap here, but don't worry about that in a commodity related stock. Yeah, it looks good. Absolutely. Was there a screen, uh, your stock selection webinar, and what you're doing now? $1,460. <laughs> No, all jokes aside, a lot, like I say, that's why the flash drives are such a good bargain because a lot of what um, I explain comes out in these webinars. But the, uh, the the stock selection webinar is more specific, and the goal is just to pick the best stocks. And you're going to get that in little pieces from me each week uh, here, okay? But this is not directed just to that. We cover a lot of ground here, and then we often go back over a lot of concepts here because people ask me, and the goal of these weekly webinars is not only to teach but to show the methodology in action and to cover market conditions and to cover your stocks and and how they relate or do not relate to the methodology okay and plus it's a, it's a relaxing way for me to have a lot of fun uh, this looks okay this is a copper stock in here a uh, nice breakout nice pullback I'll give that an okay okay how about that meatball pitch <laughs> Am I selling today? <laughs> well, you know, I was doing these things for my health, and then um, realized, you know, you get that you get that go to webinar bill in for a few grand, and then you get the uh, the website bill in, and then you get the the telecom bill in, and it's like after a while, it's like you know, maybe I need to at least try to recoup some of those costs. So I'm not that altruistic. Uh, RFP, yeah, on a pullback, that might work. Uh, forest products, paper, eh, can't get that excited about a consumer non-durable. But, hey, sometimes those C&Ds can trend, okay? Plus, you get, uh, you do get six months free of the trading service, so that's 1460 minus 800 bucks. So that's that's not still not too bad, okay? Good show, Prox. How many people watch these videos each week? Uh, why would you ask that question? A couple thousand. <laughs> my room is limited to a thousand. I haven't filled it up yet. So more people are here than I have reviews on Amazon. That's why I complain every week because not everybody here has given me a review. Yeah, this SCCO looks okay. Uh, these copper stocks, like everything else, metal related, could be a little choppy. Did I just talk about that one? Uh, yeah, it's not too many days of the pullback, but yeah, if it keeps pulling back, then obviously you, you don't want to go with that. What do you, what do I think of Q? I think he's a cool character. Oh, stock Q. Uh, it would have to make new highs decisively and then pull back again because it's already coming out of its pullback in here. Uh, SGG proxy for sugar futures. Commodities have been on fire. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, you got a bottom in sugar. Sure. Um, you know, if all you did traded commodities, if I ever got my CTA going again, this is probably what I would do. Just I would just trade. You know, there's so many things that I'm going to do, I guess, when I retire, haha, <laughs> quote, unquote, and retire. I'm going to trade commodities in Forex off of all-time lows, and that's all I'm going to do. 
uh, especially commodities. Forex, I do all-time highs too. But commodities, I think if all you did was trade all-time lows or multi-year lows, I think you'd do just fine in commodities, okay? For instance, uh, you hit a bow tie here at major, major lows. That's a huge move in sugar, okay? Huge, okay? So, uh, yeah, I hear you, man. It uh, looks like a bottom's in place there. Wait for the next pullback. Take a look at DBA, okay? Anybody watching this? Okay, that's uh, agricultural fund here. Look how beautiful that is, okay? Coming off of, I don't know, about a five-year low in here. You got a bow tie. What did I say earlier? Trade those bow ties off of those major, 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 major lows. Look at that. Bam. Winning. Looks like we got a pretty serious bottom in commodities happening at this point. I'm just saying. Better use a bracket order or just a stop order. I'm not sure exactly what you mean by a bracket because that can mean a thousand different things. Uh, if you are familiar with contingency orders, then yeah, use a contingency order where you say if the stock is trading below the stop and the bid is below the stop, then uh, I want to exit the stock uh, at the market. That's fine. Yep, Ukraine was the third highest grain exporter three years ago. Well, Phil, don't confuse the issue with facts. All right, we've got a, we're just about out of time here. Well, we've been out of time, actually. YOD for Andre. Uh, no, uh, did we talk about that one? It's too much of a bottle rocket. Uh, STV. STV. You know, Don didn't show up. I guess I picked on him too much last week. Uh, it's got some issues longer term. It's sort of a little thin. Um, I don't like this big wide range bar here, which is pretty much most of the run. So I don't know. I think it would have to make a run for new highs and then pull back. Yeah, let's talk about F, just because Don's not here. <laughs> uh, too many days in the pullback. But it does still look like it's in a lot, it looks like it's in a lot of trouble. Okay. <laughs> Don's Ford broke down. <laughs> uh, that's funny. That's a little inside joke. Uh, get the uh, flash drives, and that'll make sense of that. ISS? No, it can't be right. ISIS? Oh, much better. Oh, by the way, you guys, uh, thanks, you know, you guys, stock picking is getting better and better. Um, uh, yeah, that looks okay. Uh, it's just a little, one or two little bar pullback. I'd like to see a little bit more pullback. I'm sorry, a breakout. I'd like to see a little bit more breakout before the pullback, but I certainly can't argue with that one. That one looks pretty good. Keep that on your watch list for sure. Well, look, um, these recordings get hard to process after about an hour and a half, and we're about uh, an hour and 33 minutes in. So let me go ahead and shut things down. As usual, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you guys taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. If you can't tell, I'm having a blast doing these things, and I'm glad. I'm just humbled that you guys would show up. So thank you so much. Uh, any questions, shoot me an email, dave at davelandry.com. And, again, thanks for coming. Uh, if we don't talk again, have a great weekend. I'll see you again next week. Thank you so much.